Roadman Saf. Hey everyone, this is Neil. Hey yo, it's your boy Funky, the coolest teen rapper online. What's up? It's me, Alfie. You're listening to The Cool Table with Aiden. Listening to the cool and table. you're listening to The Cool Table. You're listening to The Cool Table. And uh, I'm not sure if you know this, but right now you're in the cut with my man, Adriel Smiley. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. This is to the cool table. This is CJRU 12 80 AM in Toronto. And we're in the cut with a living legend, Mr. <laughs> Mr. David Strickland. How you doing? Good, sir. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Honestly, talking to living legends is probably one of my favorite things because, you know, Kanye has that line where he says, if you admire someone, you should go ahead and tell them people never get the flowers or they can still smell them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's what... You know, I like to do is like give people their props for, you know, stuff they've done while they're here. Because again, it's like, you know, when when you're not here, you you can't even hear that stuff that everyone says. So so, I want to give you the respect while you're here. But I wanted to start from the beginning because you're from Scarborough. Scarborough, Scarborough bred, Scarborough dead. Mm -hmm. And I'm from from Scarborough too. So where where in Scarborough are you from? What high school did you go to? And how did Scarborough kind of get you started? I went to I went to David and Mary Thompson. Um, Shout out uh, David and Mary Thompson, which just got torn down. Um, Actually, yeah, yes, oh, legit this that's summer. Crazy. Damn. Um, I was trying to get a brick out of it, but I missed that. But yeah, Scarborough. I was born at Kennedy in Eglinton. Okay, so my pops was born in the house back home, back east, and mm-hmm. I was almost born in the house as well. But I was born at Kennedy Eglinton in the townhouses. Be by across from Kennedy Station. Um, I can't remember the name of them, but um, they're in the back there. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. They're a little grimy now, but then we moved around a bit. I ended up in Gilder, near Gilder, beside Gilder, and you know, mm-hmm. Gilder City all day. Uh, Cataraki, that Cataraki Gilder, that's where I came up, you know, in the 80s with the men. And, that's where my crew's from, you know, and yeah, that evolved yeah. from there, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, okay, okay. Cause block thirteen, you know what it is. Yeah, <laughs> you know what it is for real. I, I'm. I want to know like who was, because the eighties in Toronto, in Toronto, like hip hop or even like Toronto music is like almost a different world than even the early two yeah. thousands or now. It's you know what what was around then that you kind of like had your eye on music as a career or even got you to start making beats. Well, my first um, experience, my my brother. You know, shout out to Rumble, Rumble and Strong. Go check out Rumble and Strong. Rumble's one of the first MCs, real MCs from the city. And he was, mm-hmm. he got signed to G Street. If you go check out, he had songs like Safe, um, Crazy Jam. And Rumble was the first one to like really put me on to like, um, you know, he had a SP 1200. And that was how I started to get into production by using his SP. Um, but he was a big force and, you know, seeing him do it, watching him do shows, um, just being around certain people. And that was my first kind of like, like putting my toes in the water. Like, oh, okay, what's this all about, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So shout out Rumble, I always big him up for giving me this kind of a start. Everybody will tell me that I put in the work, but I mean, sometimes you need to be inspired. So I mean, you know, Rumble really inspired me a lot. And a lot of my friends were were trying to, you know, a lot of people were trying to do music back then. and you know most of them didn't make it this far but you know um yeah scarborough and then you know we used to go downtown and go to parties and all kind of crazy stuff that's mm-hmm. Really, mm-hmm. i got my teeth cut yeah i know i know i know all, i know all about that i know all about that yeah um when it comes to like i guess your your sound in particular because I assume that people come to you for a certain sound. They're like, okay, Dave to do this. If I want to get this way, he's the one I got to rock with. What was your first, like, beats? What were they? What did they sound like compared to, like, the sound that people ended up knowing you for? Like, did you always, were you always close to that sound or were you on some completely different stuff? Um, it, it was kind of an evolution. I still got, like, I could still pull up beats from, like, 95 and stuff. That And sometimes I just cringe, you know? I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> But, I mean, the technology was different, uh, you know, but um, the learning factor, you know, and I'm not a music, like, I didn't go to school and wasn't taught how to play piano and didn't learn about 
you know, music. Like I learned music fundamentals in engineering school. I didn't, mm -hmm. nobody sat me down and taught me about drums and drum programming and none of that. Like I had to learn everything on my own mm -hmm. pretty much. So for me to um, evolve, so to speak, it was, it was quite the, quite the stark comp comparison from then till now, right? When I look back, I'm like, damn, you came a long way. You know what I'm saying? Mm. When, when did you start to feel nice? Because like you know, even even listening to, even listening to to the spirit of hip hop, I'm like, there's some beats in there that I had that I'm like, yo, these are basically flawless. Like I'm not gonna lie to you, there's some beats you have on there where I'm like, yo, this, you you can tell he's been doing this for such a hot minute. Like these are like right. these are almost flawless beats. When did you really feel nice, like in the stuff you were doing yourself, that you were like, what? Like I got this. Um, as far as production, uh, I wouldn't say until maybe. Oh, oh, four, five, six. Yeah, really. Well, because I would, I was always kind of like, um, I guess not timid, but like shy. I wouldn't share stuff a lot. I would, you know, like I don't want to be called whack, so I would be this real guard my stuff. I wouldn't let too many people hear it. And then people would hear stuff and be like, "Damn, what are you doing? Why are you hiding this stuff?" Ah, right? I see. I see. Yeah, I feel, I feel that. I feel that. And a lot of times here in Canada, people, well, Toronto anyway, people will like, if I'm dope, so I, this is from my experience anyway, if, I, if I'm, my shit, if my stuff is popping, sometimes people, instead of bigging you up, will try to hate on you and push you in another direction, push you out the way, right? And, oh, yeah, that's whack. And then meanwhile, it's, it's not whack, right? Mm. Um, so for me, it was being in America a lot. That's what gave me the confidence. Um, Guys like Eric Sermon, my big brother, and Redman, and, and people who would encourage me and, and tell me and be supportive, right? As opposed to, I found up here, you, there was a lack of, you know, I had support, don't get me wrong, but there was a lot of, a lot of times people wouldn't, you know, everybody's trying to get their shine on, right? So yeah, it's competitive, yeah. right? So I understand, but now, you know, we got to lift each other up. Because it hurts to hear that because it's like, Everyone knows it's a screw face capital and that's how it's been going down for a minute. But, you know, even you saying that is like, I, I, I could, I had so many like situations in my mind, just you saying like, it's whack. And someone says, cause, I, cause there's people that, you know, I may hear of from someone else. like, Oh, so-and-so being speeds, they're cool. They're whatever. And right. then I hear the beats and I'm like, okay, they're, they're better than cool. Like you, yeah, you, you weren't going to tell me this, I, you know, I used to call it Haterville. Ooh, that's a good one. Because I was in, I'd go to Atlanta, I'd go to New York, and I'd go to Atlanta. And Atlanta it was complete opposite. I I wouldn't even know people, and people would be showing me mad love, and I'm like, yo, this place is like the opposite yeah. of Haterville. And you know, so those two things, you know, I had to go somewhere else almost. I mean, I don't get me wrong, I get a lot of love in Toronto, but yeah. like maybe it's identity thing. I don't know. I just I I, I got my self worth when I left. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. And people always say to me, sometimes, you know, people will make comments and I'm like, yo, America loves me more than Canada. And they're like, how can you say that? And I'm like, well, you know, and I give them, you know, mm -hmm. examples, but you know, these are also people who are like family or they're not in the industry or they don't get what I'm saying, you know, and, yeah, yeah. And, you know, but now things are a little different. This run, I've been getting a lot of love from Canada. So, I mean, I've always been hiding in the shadows anyway, so mm -hmm. I didn't really expect anybody to know anything about me you know what i'm saying true true yeah I, I definitely feel like you're getting a lot of love now and this is why i said at the top like we got to give our legends the, the respect it's because it's like you know we can wait for you to be validated you know down down south and then that's when we want to validate you right right and at the same time it's like the talent is the talent you know because yeah. That, there's a difference between someone who's just kind of popping down south and they may not be the caliber of someone like you you know that you can you got to give that person their respect as well but i feel like for the ones who are taking it further in so many different ways and who are actually talented like that has, we got to give that a little extra a little extra clout that's just so yeah i mean down there was like i've been doing records from here and for there from time so it's not like you know we already blew up so mm -hmm. i didn't really have nothing to prove so it wasn't about you know what I'm saying? Like, I can roam around the city anonymously. Mm. Like, people don't know who I am. It's mm. in a good way sometimes. Because sometimes that attention can be bad. But sometimes I have experiences where people, like, do recognize me or somebody figures it out and goes, mm. and then they treat me different, right? Mm. And I'm like, 
damn, like, I know you guys, I love that my city loves me, but like some people are like, they need to be told before. I'm like, you should just be nice anyway. You know? <laughs> facts, facts, facts. When, when you like, I guess we're making beats around that time. Did you think that you would be putting out albums as a producer? Is that something that you, that you thought of when you first started making beats? No, not at all. I wasn't planning on doing an album um, uh, by any means. The last time I ever thought about doing my own project, I was an MC, and that was probably like in the mid '90s, early mm. '90s, when I was still rhyming, and, and um, that's what led me to engineering. But I wasn't trying to do an album. But the thing was that I was in a place that was like post Drake, mm-hmm. right? I was trapped here, so I thought. Uh, my squad, Death Squad, big up the Death Squad was was you know they'll they'll keep it going without me if I'm there or not. The show must go on, right? So I was up here, and I was trying to figure out what am I doing, and I thought maybe I need to do something for myself, and I was kind of like in this process of decolonizing and on this journey, and you know kind of checking out the music in my community and then i was like maybe i should try a ting just do Mm -hmm. something for me for once because all this time i never did anything for myself Mm -hmm. i always put my energy into other people's uh projects and a lot of times i would get forgotten or left behind or people would forget who who put in the work to help them get where they were or you know and they wouldn't bring you along you know i'm saying and you're like damn like why would you why would you get on a train with the guy who built the train and driving the train? And as soon as the train's picking up speed, you throw him off the train. Like For real? you need that guy to run. <laughs> so I couldn't figure that one out. So I was like, you know what? Maybe let me just try. And and, and originally it wasn't supposed to be a big deal. Mm-hmm. I was just going to bang it out and just throw it out, mm-hmm. you know, and that would have been it. And, but it, it started getting to the point where people were hearing about what I was doing Mm-hmm. And you know, if you listen to the album now, you could see maybe that's why. But it evolved a lot, and I think it's you know it was it was a good decision because, um, in some ways, it gave me the recognition that other people feel I need. Mm-hmm. I don't feel I need. I already know what I've done. I don't need nobody to to big me up to make me feel better or good. I, I'm I I got nothing to prove. I already know what I'm capable of, but other people who are not in the industry seem like they needed to see that for me. Mm -hmm. Um, And in some, in some cases it did kind of put me in my proper place in, you know, Canadian music history, because I guess maybe without that project, you're just a background player. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So this kind of opens up the conversation and opens up because a lot of people are, you know, didn't know my, you know, even myself is lost on me, the impact I've had. You know, I, I was talking to somebody the other day and I was like, ah, psh. but nah, it's, mm. you know, it's true. I have left a little fingerprint, if you want to say, on more, more, more than a little, more than a little. And like you talking about how it, it almost happened organically and it wasn't planned to be a big deal or anything like that. And I think about the songs you've done for Meth or Red or, EPMD or Drake and those guys and it's like those re- like you've done such a good job with other people's records like you said but there's no way anyone would kind of have a full scope of of what it is that you do yeah I kind of had to put it together and put it in front of you and go look this is me here's my album but look at all this other stuff and you're like damn like you know and I, th- I rock with it heavy because the album is like good <laughs> like it's not just like oh we hear these good beats okay it's cool right. it's not like it's not just the album itself it being an album is an accomplishment it's good regardless right and it's like so for you you should i feel like you should have a hand in putting out like some of the best hip-hop coming out of canada in terms of a full body of work because well you, the thing you about you right the thing about that is i learned so much doing stuff like people don't understand like some people didn't like the 421 method man album mm-hmm. okay some people loved it but regardless of that there's things on there like that you learn along the way. Like I've done stuff where I've gone to mastering, I've been there, but on that album, you know, me and Eric put the song order. Me and Eric were at, were at the mastering session, right? So there's skills you pick up by doing stuff like that, that when it comes to your own project, 
Mm. You can see how it comes into play like that order. I that order was a big deal for me. I I try to figure that out for a minute. I had different, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. and that is important when you're listening to an album. How Man, one that, song that order is big. That order is big. Yeah, yeah, I know that. Like, I and I think that the album for me. I I, I want to talk about some of the other stuff first, but let's let's talk about the album now. I think it's this perfect time. Question last being like the first song after the intro. Right, right. I, I thought you that was that. and that and that first line where he goes, These Winnipeg roads, the public ain't ready. Exactly. And maybe maybe it's just me, but when when I hear Kenyan artists shout out their town, their blog, like I rock with that so, so, so heavy. And what the song goes on to be, despite already just just already when you get to that point, right. what the song goes on to be is huge at the beginning was that always the the first song or was that maybe that, that was that actually the first that, that was the first song i recorded for the album oh, so wow. i was like that has to be the first song then when it, the title came i was like that definitely has to be the first song and if you ever been you ever been to winnipeg not been to winnipeg winnipeg is is a different place um and i've been i've been there a lot so um i got the feel and you know, shout out Charlie Feta, John C, and Bubbles, because, and you know, I have so many friends out there. Shout out to Boogie the Beat and Sebastian Gaskin, and the list goes on. But you know, Colin, there's so many people out there that hold me down. Mm -hmm. And Winnipeg is definitely a serious place. It's not a joke. Um, you know, we think Toronto's grimy, screw face, cat, no, but Winnipeg is, they don't play over there. Mm -hmm. um, so I needed to show that kind of side of it. And, you know, like it is questions last, you know, there's, you, I'm glad you caught that because uh -huh. the beginning, the first stuff, like that could have been last, that mm -hmm. song, right? For real. But, for real. Nah, it needed to be first. Nah, and it, need, it needed to be first for sure because like me, when I listen to an album, the first, the first couple songs and for sure the first couple bars, um, they usually let me know what kind of type of time we're going to be on. Uh, is the album going to be something that's going to have something I'm going to remember in terms of what they're talking about? Am I going to feel kind of confident? You go. You're back. Oh, I'm back now? Yeah. No worries, no worries. Um, yeah, I'm saying, like, I need I need to have an album have that kind of intro. Like, that let lets me know what kind of what type of time I'm on. You know, the first couple, first two or three songs. Yeah. Once you hear, once you hear those, like, okay, I, I, know, I know where we're headed now. You know, I know what kind of ears I got to have on for this. So I don't I, think people were expecting that. That, no, definitely not. Definitely not. Um, helpless. Helpless is, is really <laughs> one that stands out a lot to me. Like, I, I helpless kind of reminds me of a song that I don't know if it exists in the same way anymore. Um, well, the thing about that song is that was the last song I did for the album. Oh, crazy! It wasn't even like like um, Violent Ground happened to be in town. We did a little. They did some shows of Mad Child, so I went with them, and then we were just hanging out. And I was like, "We should do something while you're here." And it wasn't really supposed to be for the album because they're already on the album mm -hmm. on Res Life. But to me, I was like, I wanted to do something new. And then that song, the topic, I just lost. I mean, I lost probably almost thirty people making this album. Damn. So when that song came up, one of my best friends had just passed last summer, and I did that song about a year ago. And it was really hard. Like, I cried making that song after, like, uh, we recorded it. Then mm -hmm. I came home and worked on it. And the emotion is, and you can probably feel it in there because it's the subject matter is one thing, but it's also helpless, was how I was feeling at the time because it was like I'm watching everybody die around me and I can't do shit about it. You can't, yeah, you can't, do no, you can't do nothing. That's real. And it's not even just murders or. Oh, Sue, like some people were killing themselves. People were getting shot. People were ODing. People were in car accidents. People were dying of cancer. Like, it was all kind of shit. Mm -hmm. You feel me? So, like, I have no, I can't, uh, who the fuck am I? Pardon my language. Who am I? No, for real. No, and it's like, you got to deal with it. No, I, and I, I, I felt that for real because that, that helpless feeling, especially when you're in a position where, you, where you're always trying to hold people down. It's like right. when you when you can that hurts even more because it's not like you it's not like you wouldn't if there was even some kind of way right. you know so yeah, yeah I I felt that one my my favorite part of the album is it's not my favorite song but the 
Turtle Island to the world. Turtle, Turtle Island to the world. <laughs> Every well, you know, Whitey, Whitey said originally, so the song had a different name. Mm -hmm. Whitey came in and he said, I said, yo, you got to shut up Turtle Island. And I had to break it down for him. I'm like, listen, man, you can't say Turco. You can't <laughs> say Turco. Because <laughs> if you say Turco, they're not going to know like, what, what the hell are you talking about. Like, the, you got to say Turtle. So I forced him to say Turtle because oh my I said, God. also, Yardman is going to say Turtle Island. And everybody <laughs> else is going to be like, Yo, Star, what what are they talking about? Right? Yo, that's so. that's why he stood out because he didn't say Turkle. Because I would have assumed for sure it would have right. been Turkle Island to the world. Yeah. Oh Which my was, god. Like, I had to I had to stand out on that one because, but yeah, that <laughs> song was definitely special. Nah, for sure. And when I listened to the remix album, like I'm I'm I I was really like you know because you're a hip hop dude, I'm like, what are, are we gonna hear new verses on the remix album? Right. Or, you like you know different production there was one on the the enemies remix who oh there was i didn't catch that so on enemies it's me and and um snotty nose mm -hmm. right on the verses me and sten jotty on the chorus so mm -hmm. sten being a rapper was like damn and i was doing the remix um shout out to hagler hagler did the remix but i was like yo what if we just get because their verse is eight bars and eight bars and I'm yeah. doing a 16 and I'm like, yo, I'm not a rapper no more. <laughs> what if I cut my verse and gave them a verse? So there is a new verse on there. Okay, I okay. thought about doing more of that. Um, but originally when I started doing remixes, I wasn't even thinking about making it an EP. Like, mm -hmm, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? I was just trying to, trying to TIG again, right? Yeah, yeah. And then, so that means you must have heard the dance remix. Yeah. that's where I was going next. For 100%. But before that, I wanted to talk about Turtle Island. The the remix on Turtle Island is probably the one song on the remix album that I like. Like, I like that beat way better than the original. And oh, I, yeah. Some I, people do and some people don't. And some and people I, are like, oh, I, I love it. But, you know, that, the, mm. you know, the dance hall vibe and the whole vibe of the original song. But, but I mean, it's Rockweiler. What do you want me to say? Like exactly. But I, I, I definitely didn't think that. Like going into the remix project, I was like, I don't know, man. The, the original project was so right. fun. I don't want to hear no remix. Don't ruin nothing. it. Right. <laughs> I know it's it. It is can, could be risky, but I think it came off well uh, overall. That's I wanted sure. to do more, but I, I also didn't want to do every song because at the same time, mm. the, the gift and the curse is that. I spent so long doing this record. It was out, and I'm like, okay, it's close. Turn the page, right? Mm -hmm. No, here, do it, do it again <laughs> with the same song. I'm like, no, exactly. it's like a bad dream. Exactly. It was yeah, like, like Groundhog Day. So <laughs> I'm kind of thankful I didn't have to do uh, seven more songs because it's actually nine songs, right? One mm -hmm. has two remixes. Yeah, no, nah, you it, it it definitely like lived up to it because you get a different vibe on so many of the songs, and it's yeah. like, you, you know, you can find a new love um for the for the remixes yeah. you said that at the end of say you can hear you smoking a blunt yeah so i went and listened back to it because i was like i don't remember this definitely yeah, to the album i well i i i found it i listened to it like literally at the end and it you are pulling that blunt so yeah, hard. <laughs> i remember that because that goes back to what i was talking about 421 and me and eric sermon were um putting the album in order Mm -hmm. And we we're trying to make it like so it goes so there's no pauses yeah and we were playing around with different ideas and then when it came to that song we're like wow we need something and eric said yo, yo g go in the booth and lay a blunt and i'll record it and we'll put it you know what i'm saying it was like all right right and not thinking <laughs> till later i'm like damn i'm on the album you know what i'm saying like because sometimes those guys have a way of getting me on. If you go listen to one of uh, Keith Murray's rap Raphobia, I'm on the record on like two or three songs. I'm on, I have vocals. Oh, wow. right. But people don't know that, right? Because we don't talk about it, but I'm there. No, that, that was interesting. I like that one a lot because I was like, this is, this was a real pull. And so yeah. I was like, I was, I was, I was, I was like, God, this, this blunt was fresh. That was a Dutch master. Oh my God. Oh my God. That's yeah, Long I, Island, Long Island, all the show up in Long Island. Yo, yeah, that honestly, when I heard that, I was like, that took me to the place. I was like, yeah, my I closed my eyes a little bit <laughs> when I when I heard it. That's funny. Um, we're we're almost done here. I want to talk about some of the stuff you've done with Drake. Now, "Will Be Fine" is such a like. There's so the songs I keep I forget. 
go back and look. And then there's songs where I was supposed to have credit that I didn't, and then whatever mm. happened, and then I forget. Like even I'm wearing this today. Mm. You know, this was like God. I found some pictures the other day, and I'm like, holy cow! Like it's such a blur because we're. I remember the last week before it was mm -hmm. before it was handed in. We were we didn't sleep. You know, we were wow. just like we were just going. Like it was painful. But when there's like money behind it, it, it makes a big difference. And, you know, it's like do or die. And those were like some crazy times. Man. Now, I, I can I can imagine. I I remember the lead up to that album and it being like, it, it has to it has to sell this. It has to be big. Yeah. Um, the anticipation, right? The, the thing I was thinking about while looking at some of your producer credits, especially for the Drake album, is like you you have credits on some of the songs that I think are like, such standouts and not just in the the project themselves but in like even you could say in history like of you know of music basically because it's like i think about we'll be fine and the language there have been like 20 artists trying to remake the language for right. <laughs> for, for for how long now right. and then you, then you think about we'll be fine you know that that song is just like a mix of almost an era before it with the current time that it came out in, but I haven't heard a song like that um, since, you know? So it's like, in, you know, these are not the songs that always get kind of the, the credit as the other big songs that um, you may have, but right. just looking through it, I just, I saw that through line and I'm like, you know, these are, these are sounds and songs that, you know, one, not every artist can pull off and not every producer can pull off, but that people have been retrying right. for almost it a decade sense. now. Some of it gets lost on me. I just keep, I keep it moving and I forget. Mm -hmm. And then I go back, like I was out somewhere the other day and somebody was pulling up like, oh, you did this song and this song and this song and then, and I was like, damn, like I, in my head, I'm like, okay. In my head, Redman, my favorite rapper, I work with Reggie. After that, I'm not even paying attention because I'm so excited. Like, yeah, wow, we're at the, we're at the dance. Cool. But so much stuff happened after that. And mm -hmm. then you start adding the names up. You're like, holy cow. I'm like, who? You talking <laughs> about me? Nah, right? Like, that's how I look at it. I'm like, nah, like, like I'm still amazed at half of the stuff. So I'm just I, having to have it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I get lost on all the, you know, like, oh, Rick Ross. You start name dropping. I'm going damn that's right? me and yeah and i don't use that i don't I, I don't i don't come with it like that like oh like you know on some some bad but, shit. but you know that i could feel it because it's like i like after you work with someone like red it's just like who who are the rest of you you know it's like yeah like it's it's yeah, cool, you guys but are great but you know like you know, yeah you know, I, man, I, 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 I when you're that. yeah it's it's more like and that could apply to anybody i mean it's just mm -hmm. a matter of the individual i used to tell my moms i'm like moms it's like you're an Elvis fan or the Beatles, and then you're in the studio with them. Your head explodes, you know? Like, For sure. And then you're making sure. music with them, and you're like, how did I get here? You know how many times I've been like, yo, how did I get here? Mm -hmm. I've been in situations that I'm like, yo, how? what am I doing here? Right? But I guess, you know, I'm thankful, you know, at the end of the day, I'm thankful. 100%. We do a segment on the show called Wednesday Wisdom, and our boy Brandon Gibbs has a new motivational quote or saying that he kind of goes over every week. Do you have anything for yourself that you kind of keep in mind that keeps you going every week over and over again? Um, I lean on my culture. I, I you know, when I, things get rough, I, I tend to um, go back to the basics and, uh, you know, I smudge or I do ceremony or, you know, I, 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 I lean on that to keep me strong because, um, mm -hmm. you know, everybody's going to have, hard times you know like and not like hard times like just money but like sometimes every day days can be struggles for people mental health emotional like all kind of you know you got to keep that in mind that's why i try to be nice to people um nicer you know i try to be nice to strangers you know i'm not gonna let nobody punk me off at the same time but i try to have a good energy and be uplifting instead of being you know um, on that other side, because you know, you can see where that can go sometimes. You hear the, the drill now, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that listen, that's that's actually perfect timing because, um, we're, we're about to wrap up, so I want to thank you again for joining us on In the Cut. Thanks for having me, brother.
Yeah, if it's your first time listening to the podcast, give us a five star review, a five star rating. Make sure you subscribe on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, and of course on YouTube for the full interview as well. But until next time, know yourself, know your worth. Thank you.